Voy a presentar al doctor Lorenz Kirmayer, es profesor y director de la División de Psiquiatría Social y Transcultural del Departamento de Psiquiatría de la Universidad de Machín. El profesor Kirmayer expondrá sobre el conocimiento co-constructivo en salud mental global Percepciones desde el trabajo con comunidades indígenas en Canadá. Thank you very much. It's uh, I'd like to join my colleagues in uh, thanking all the organizers for the opportunity to be here with you and uh, take part in this conversation about uh, global mental health. I also have to apologize because. Uh, my uh, level of Spanish is be below preschool, primary, you know, uh, nursery school level. So I can understand about 20, 30 percent because of the similarities to French, which I speak reasonably well. Uh, but otherwise, I am like a, a child. So thank you for the privilege, really, of being able to speak uh, in, in English. Um, this is not incidental, of course, to the whole dynamic of global mental health. It's a legacy of colonialism on a global scale that I'm able to speak English here and in many other places, and that indeed the international language of science tends to be framed in English and has many uh, uh, consequences for the circulation of knowledge and our awareness of uh, global variation. Um, what I'm going to do uh, in this conversation uh, with you today is try to link some of the broad issues uh, that were raised uh, by Duncan uh, Peterson in the first uh, talk on uh, the global inequities in health and the economic and political drivers of those inequities and the barriers to resolving them in some ways, and the more um, internal dilemmas within the production of psychiatric knowledge that Alan Young uh, explored with the uh, very rich example of the construction of post-traumatic stress disorder as a diagnosis. And uh, my uh, comments are going to, in a way, bridge these two uh, because one powerful feature of global mental health is the attempt to uh, institutionalize and export uh, psychiatric knowledge in a form that implies that it's universally applicable and so that we, we have already the tools that we need to understand and to resolve the problems globally. And it's to some degree that uh, um, assumption that I'm going to challenge somewhat and uh, explore what the implications are for doing global mental health in a different way that would involve serious dialogue and engagement with local communities, with local knowledges, and um, uh, some kind of productive exchange, uh, which has many implications, epistemological implications for the nature and production of knowledge, uh, political implications for how power is distributed, and very practical implications in terms of how we function, whether as clinicians or researchers or policymakers and so on. So what I'm going to do is outline very briefly what some of the assumptions are in current uh, efforts in global mental health, particularly the movement for global mental health as it's been framed as a sort of uh, global regrouping of people who are committed to addressing global health inequalities. Uh, and then uh, talk specifically about the aspects of this that are related to what we could call cultural and structural competence, that is becoming aware <laughs> of local context and how powerfully that shapes people's experience of mental suffering and the kinds of solutions that work for them, either individually or in families or communities. And this raises some very interesting questions, some very deep questions, really, about the nature of knowledge, the nature of uh, how communities are constituted around certain understandings of knowledge and practice. Again, this was something uh, uh, implicit in Allen's discussion about how psychiatry constitutes itself as an international community with certain agreed upon anchor points uh, and in the process maybe uh, hides or puts to one side the very particular histories and very uh, local contexts in which knowledge is generated. Uh, and then I'm going to use the example of work with indigenous people in Canada to try to uh, show, um, give some ideas about other ways of working that are more dialogical. This is interesting not only because it's uh, my home country and it's our own internal dilemmas of dealing with huge inequalities in Canada, 
but because it also puts global mental health in a different perspective, that it's not just a question of um, uh, some wealthy countries of the north, let's say, being concerned about other parts of the world and equity there, but it's an issue for every country in terms of internal uh, inequalities and structural problems that sometimes are very similar to those experienced elsewhere, and it's for you to think about what elements of the Canadian sort of colonial and, and I, I don't know if we can say post-colonial situation uh, are similar uh, to that in, uh, in uh, Chile or in other Latin American countries since all uh, North, Central and South America experienced European colonization in ways that were very uh, uh, pr profound for uh, indigenous peoples. And then I'll try to bring out some general implications for global mental health. Uh, so as Duncan has already pointed out, our current efforts to address the inequalities on a global scale exist against a historical backdrop of very powerful forces of colonization and migration that have shaped uh, the current configuration of nation states and uh, international institutions in the contemporary world. Uh, and thinking through in an ongoing way the nature of uh, post-colonial institutions is a very important part of this process. Um, Psychologization, and more specifically psychiatrization, that is the uh, implantation of particular ways of thinking about human beings and human problems and particular sets of um, practices related to some aspects of health are part of those processes of global change. Uh, and they are interesting, I think, not only because it's part of our own everyday uh, concerns as practitioners, but because they reach from the largest formations of global discourse down to very intimate spheres of life and how people understand their, the goals of their life and the sources of their problems and the ways to solve them. So trying to understand how the exportation uh, and circulation of ideas in psychiatry reshapes individual experience uh, of, of um, people in families and communities is a very important endeavor. It's one that's hard for those of us from within mental health to do very well because we're operating all the time with a shared set of assumptions and we sometimes don't realize how uh, striking and how different some of those assumptions may be from the way that people are living their lives every day. And we need to keep open a space to learn about that and have that uh, dialogue. At the same time, psychiatry is not only uh, offering things to people that they can make use of and they may take up because they seem uh, to be uh, a la mode or, or uh, uh, enabling or liberatory for people, uh, but all, psychiatry also <laughs> serves functions of social control since uh, among the spectrum of problems that we are mandated to deal with are included forms of suffering that can be very disruptive for families and for communities. And so a certain amount of social power is given to psychiatry and this of course raises a whole set of profound ethical uh, and human rights issues uh, and issues that have often been the focus of a great deal of critique of psychiatry uh, in, in many places. Finally, uh, the process of uh, addressing global mental health on, a glob on, on uh, uh, multiple scales uh, reflects larger economic uh, institutions and values. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, as we'll come to, uh, there are powerful ways in which the global pharmaceutical industry uh, is a driver and a, and a beneficiary of efforts uh, at, in global mental health, and that in itself raises a very serious set of ethical issues that we need to be thinking about uh, all, all the time. Um, uh, Duncan and I have uh, tried to articulate, as coming out of a symposium we had at McGill a few years ago with Vikram Patel and uh, other uh, leaders in uh, global mental health, tried to articulate a critique of some aspects of global mental health from a more cultural, social, structural, and uh, political economic uh, perspective. Uh, and it, it, it's based on uh, analyzing kind of the logical structure or the uh, the core arguments of the movement for global mental health, which I think uh, can be roughly summarized in, in this form. Uh, the first effort is to try to document the level of global uh, burden and, and disparities uh, in uh, mental health and the construction of the disability adjusted life years and the various mathematical models that have been used to put uh, non-communicable diseases and, uh, and uh, psychiatric disorders in particular uh, on a kind of comparable metric uh, 
uh, to diseases that cause mortality has been a very important technical step in uh, launching this argument. That leads to the second point, which is given the enormous burden that then can be uh, projected uh, through, uh, largely through estimates uh, around the world, it seems like mental health should be a much higher priority than it is. This is good news for mental health practitioners. Suddenly our work is much more important and deserves more money and more resources. I said there was no conflict of interest at the beginning. Clearly there's a very serious conflict of interest here in the sense that we all stand to gain uh, in terms of uh, having more uh, impact and more resources to address our, our work. Uh, the third and fourth points are particularly important in terms of the more nuanced uh, uh, approach that we want to advocate for, uh, and that is that the disparities globally are then framed in terms of a treatment gap. That is, given the fact that uh, there's huge numbers of people who have different kinds of problems and are disabled by them, the <coughs> presumed uh, problem is that these people need more services. They need interventions, uh, presumably pr provided by uh, professionals or in a modality that is similar to what mental health practitioners would provide. Uh, and then, therefore, the main strategy is how can we take what we already know works in certain places and make it available, scale it up. So this is the bare outline of the logic of current uh, efforts in global mental health. Uh, and the dilemmas are that each of these points can be contested to varying degrees, not simply to tear it down or to negate it, but to imply the need for more refined models for research and for ultimately a wider range, perhaps, of <coughs> solutions and interventions. Uh, the first issue I've already alluded to, which is that these estimates of global burden are, in fact, very crude, and assume that uh, we have universally applicable methods of eliciting and diagnosing problems and that that is sufficient to canvas the range. That is, we're not leaving anything important out and we're getting an accurate sense of the kinds of problems. And that, as I say, is very debatable in certain areas. Uh, the second is whether uh, mental health problems per se are the best way of characterizing the inequalities that we're talking about or whether they are merely an outcome one of many outcomes of other structural inequalities, poverty, violence, and so on, that are drivers not only of mental health problems, but of all kinds of, health, uh, of other problems, health and uh, social inequalities, and so on. And the third, uh, that we should frame this as a treatment gap rather than perhaps as a gap in local infrastructure at the level of community solidarity and indigenous uh, healing resources. And that then has implications for the final step in the argument as to whether the goal is more psychiatry for everybody or more psychology or more uh, community mental health workers, or whether there are also local indigenous processes of healing, of resilience, of uh, economic development, and so on and so forth, that might be equally or at times more important strategies to ultimately improve mental health. I don't think, although this is perhaps a little bit challenging to mental health practitioners, I don't think in the bigger scheme of thing, any of these criticisms are particularly um, uh, provocative or, or uh, outrageous. They really fit with larger uh, development agendas, uh, and the remaining question is what role does mental health play in, in all of this? So there are persistent controversies, and we had at this uh, symposium a few years ago at McGill, as I say, we had people representing the global mental health movement, which is very much driven from a public health perspective that assumes that we can take the best evidence-based practices developed in urban centers and uh, the North and the West and so on, and export those uh, with minor modifications elsewhere. Uh, and they were, that, that sort of perspective was um, uh, challenged by uh, people coming from a much more uh, grassroots community orientation, arguing that uh, there really are uh, different approaches and a different uh, distribution of um, power uh, that needs to happen for a healthier debate and a healthier process of uh, developing strategies. Uh, but to some degree, the argument that occurred at our symposium was also around different kinds of problems. So the most heated disagreements seem to occur when one person had in mind somebody with very severe mental illness, with uh, 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 chronic schizophrenia, let's say, uh, 
who really was uh, not functioning at all and who was being physically restrained, was chained to a log somewhere in Indonesia. Uh, and really, the, what the intervention that was needed was very basic. Uh, people just needed to get some medication and have their chains removed. It's kind of like uh, Pinel uh, all over again uh, in, uh, on a global scale. And that was contrasted then with people who had in mind somebody who was demoralized, who had mild to moderate depression, uh, for reasons that could be uh, explained very much in terms of the adversity, uh, social adversity that they were grappling with, uh, and for which the solution might be some kind of activation and engagement in addressing those social problems. So those are both very valid uh, uh, issues, and maybe they require, at least in the short term, different approaches and different solutions. Uh, so the apparent argument may really come, in certain cases, may come down to having in mind a different problem and that we need differentiated solutions to address these different problems. Uh, but the last point I think is also in, in important and will become central to the rest of my talk, that there is in political science a discussion around uh, how to advance uh, um, uh, and address the inequalities in society uh, and this is often framed in terms of problems of redistribution. That is to say, uh, money that uh, is going to the wealthy few should be redistributed in some way so that everybody gets their fair share. Uh, but there's also recognition that the problems that people suffer from are not only related to economic differences, they're also related to certain kind of public civil uh, recognition of who they are as people and as communities. Uh, and that requires a different solution. It's not just a solution about money. It's a solution that's framed in terms of processes of recognition, recognition of political voice, recognition of way of life, recognition of values that may be in conflict with the dominant va values of the dominant society. So that's what I want to uh, uh, come back to as we, we go along here. Uh, so the dilemma uh, at a practical level of some of these uh, persistent controversies in global mental health is that uh, in trying to address these inequalities, with, uh, a process that is often presented with a sense of real urgency, that is people are really suffering now, something needs to be done now, and we can have all the discussions and debates we want, but in the meantime, people, we need to take action. Uh, in the process of doing that, there may be uh, inadvertently a kind of suppression and undermining of local forms of solidarity. Uh, and that this uh, may go on, the part of the energy and many of the resources for global mental health from the beginning uh, have been driven by economic interests that are in some ways at odds with or in, in fairly direct conflict with the needs and aspirations of local communities. And I've mentioned already the global pharmaceutical industry is one example of that the perspectives of a small group of uh, very powerful philanthropists uh, who've been really pushing global health uh, is another potential conflict. As well-intentioned as these individuals may be, they have their own particular views of the world, their own set of priorities, and these are play, play, playing a surprisingly large role in, in the way in which global agendas are, are being set. Uh, and the emphasis on professionals and professional mental health and the psych uh, psi disciplines uh, becomes another potentially distorting effect on local forms of solidarity, uh, helping and healing to the extent that the models that come from psychology and psychiatry and other disciplines uh, have in to varying degrees unknowing ways incorporated a particular set of values and perspectives that may be in some tension with local uh, knowledge. So there's a whole set of tensions that are worth thinking about uh, if we're serious about wanting to address uh, the inequalities, we have to grapple with these, each of which is a, a major undertaking and requires particular kinds of expertise beyond just sort of expressing concern to really advance a more um, uh, trenchant uh, analysis and uh, draw out the implications. We need to be working with colleagues coming from political science, coming from economics, coming from philosophy and other disciplines that can really help us to engage these questions. I think they're interesting questions to all of us, and those of us who work in mental health settings can enter into very interesting uh, constructive partnerships 
with people from other disciplines where we provide the examples, uh, the, prob the, the problems to be thought about, and many different disciplines can then work together analyzing these sort of case studies or situations and enriching each other's understanding. So it's a, a prime set of problems for real interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary work. Um, I, since the overall orientation of these meetings is around uh, ethical issues, I want to uh, try to emphasize some of those as we go along. Uh, and to talk about it from the point of view, first of all, of how we create kinds of spaces and opportunities for genuine exchange between different points of view. And this is the uh, leading toward the example that I will use of indigenous health. Because the dilemma we have in general is that those who have the power and the authority to frame a problem in many ways dictate the way the whole discussion will go. And this is where Alan's discussion is so important. If we decide, look, the way to measure suffering in conflict areas is to go out and interview people about PTSD, uh, then it's very clear what we're looking for. And we may not realize the extent to which we have prejudged uh, both the problem and its ultimate solution. Uh, uh, because of having um, used one kind of uh, frame or tool for analyzing uh, the situation. Uh, so we need to be looking carefully at ways of thinking about global mental health problems in a more context-sensitive way. Um, Jonathan Metzl, a historian and psychiatrist, and Helena Hansen, a psychiatrist and anthropologist, uh, have written about the notion of structural competence. And they made this intervention in the uh, US context where cultural competence has become a kind of catchword for a whole set of approaches trying to look at diversity and inequality within American society. Uh, but they suggested that cultural competence and the emphases implicit in cultural competence were not sufficient and in fact risked diverting attention from structural violence in American society. Uh, the fact of a sort of uh, racialized underclass that has persisted for, uh, you know, since the time of slavery, uh, the uh, uh, ongoing sort of social class differences that really powerfully determine people's opportunities and their exposures uh, to things like violence and to their uh, resources for recovery, uh, and that clinicians, both at a clinical level in terms of how one interprets a problem and uh, researchers in terms of how they frame health questions, needed to employ a kind of structural competence where they thought about the uh, adversities people were facing from a more structural and a social view. This is not, um, does not exclude cultural competence, but it's meant to be an essential uh, complement and enlargement of the focus in a way, and it keeps on the table a, a constant reflection on what the most powerful determinants are, what should be taken into consideration in health policy, and even at the level of a clinician uh, analyzing a patient's uh, predicament. So it's important that we conceive of this not as an either or, and in particular, I think you can make the argument that considerations of culture and context shape all of these structural issues. Sometimes when people talk about uh, social structural problems, the notion is, well, now we're really getting to the core, to poverty, inequality, violence. These are such brute facts of human existence. They trump or transcend, I don't like using the word trump anymore, the word has been spoiled for me. Um, they transcend um, any particular uh, cultural contextual analysis. Uh, but in fact, structural arrangements in each society are shaped by cultural histories and underwritten by culturally constructed categories. So the identities we have uh, as uh, uh, immigrants or refugees or settlers or, or indigenous peoples, as members of a certain social class, of a racialized group, as members of an ethnic group, all of these are culturally constructed. They, are, they come out of a local history of who different groups are, and they then have structural consequences. That is, by virtue of your skin color in North America, you will have certain kinds of encounters with the police uh, on a more frequent basis than other people. You will experience certain kinds of uh, uh, microaggression and, and, uh, and uh, hostile uh, reactions to people in a very s small scale way, in a way that really impacts on your life. You will internalize certain notions of yourself that will be a constant kind of drain on your cognitive resources. Uh, so 
in a sense, then, a culturally constructed category that says these people are lesser in some way uh, reproduces itself in many social structural ways. So this is, first of all, to break down the distinction, I, I guess, between culture, cultural um, ideologies and contexts and structural phenomena, and then to insist that we need to understand these in very particular ways in different societies. So the versions of understanding racialized identity that work in the U.S. do not fit that well in Canada, although we're pretty saturated with U.S. television and so on, so it definitely has an impact. But the demographic cons uh, constitution of the society, the histories of migration are different, and the current politics of identity are different. And of course, it, you can go across Latin America, and each country will have its own particular history, its own ways of dealing with the fact of colonization of the intermixing of, of uh, settlers with indigenous peoples and how much that is acknowledged or hidden in local ideologies of identity and so on. So all these are very important in terms of structural uh, factors, some of which are explicit, everyone's aware of, some of which are hidden and just part of the fabric of everyday life that you only become aware of if you are in a disadvantaged position yourself or if you go out and, and try to analyze these. So this is a, a, an argument, I think, for why we have to be looking at context and a very important argument uh, for consideration in terms of the global exportation of health models because simply talking about inequality in some crude way about just economic differences is not sufficient to get at the kinds of structural disadvantage, the kinds of violence that people may be experiencing in everyday life that have serious mental health consequences. There's an even more, um, I can say, subtle aspect to these cultural differences that I want to then touch on briefly and, and because it will become important in the example I'm going to give you, uh, which centers around the role that specific kinds of knowledge and tradition play in people's own sense of identity and community. So you can make the argument that there are, and we all in fact participate in to different degrees, communities that could be described in part as epistemic communities. That is to say, what constitutes the community as a group is a certain shared notion of how knowledge is produced and how uh, authoritative knowledge uh, can be sought and obtained and protected and uh, uh, applied. Uh, I, I say we all participate in these because to become a clinician, to become a physician, a psychologist, a social worker, a nurse, any mental health professional is to take part in a certain epistemic community. Often this is a community grounded in some version of science, although uh, in professional schools people don't learn that much science per se. They kind of receive science as a kind of catechism in a way that they get the products of science, not necessarily the methodology of science. And that's in some ways uh, inevitable because to be a scientist is to have a certain platform and then to do, have a lot of skepticism and doubt so you can generate new questions and do new work. To be a practitioner is to have a platform and have a certain level of confidence so that you can intervene in a way that uh, may be kind of uh, risky and demanding and you have to have some trust that what you're doing makes sense. So exactly around the issues that a sci scientist wants to question and be doubtful about and can afford a kind of radical skepticism at times, a uh, clinician uh, is in a predicament if they go too far in, in, in that direction. So there's some differences already in those two communities, and it's interesting to understand how the nature of knowledge changes as it moves from the domain of a, an active research area into the domain of clinical work uh, and what gets hidden uh, in, in that process. Uh, and certainly all the marketing that goes on to sell people uh, pharmaceuticals using very uh, uh, simplified uh, models of uh, the brain that no neuroscientist would really accept on a, uh, on a, on a good day, uh, but that uh, make for nice posters and simple arguments and so on is, is one very concrete example that we're all exposed to uh, all the time. Um, in some cases, there are notions of knowledge that are deeply rooted in local historical traditions and that are part of how people define themselves that come into direct conflict then with the push going on, and global mental health is part of this, to ground clinical work and public health interventions in evidence and in evidence-based practice and evidence being defined in terms of a certain um, uh, dominant uh, um, uh, epistemic paradigms uh, of science. So if we acknowledge that there might be different kinds of knowledge in circulation with different uh, degrees of justification, different modes of justification, and different domains of application, 
if we want to, we can either dismiss all that and say, look, in the end, it's all going to be validated by science. And one response to people coming forward and saying, well, we believe that this other thing works is to say, fine, uh, go do a randomized clinical trial and come back to me when that's done. And if it works, then we'll take seriously what you're saying. If it doesn't work, then we can rule it out to court. Uh, but another approach is to say, well, maybe um, what you're looking at, what you're looking for, is a little bit different than what we're looking for. And maybe what you get out of doing a particular form of healing, let's say, is not only a cure of symptoms, but also a strengthened sense of identity, a strengthened sense of community, a sense of meaning for the future. Okay. Okay. Um, in which case, we would need different ways of comparing things. And this raises a set of questions around pluralism and how we are going to put these together uh, in different societies. So that leads to my last, uh, my, my example, really, where I want to uh, talk about this just very briefly in the last minute or so, uh, to acknowledge in the Canadian context, we have had a history country that's built on a process of colonization of indigenous people. Uh, most of whom died because of infectious diseases and so on, as they did throughout the Americas. Uh, but then in the 1800s, Canada instituted a policy of forced assimilation uh, using residential schools. Uh, and this um, uh, led to uh, 150,000 children over the years being put in these schools and not allowed to speak their language, not allowed to learn their traditions, and being forced to adopt Euro-Canadian ways. Uh, we've had just recently in Canada uh, an apology uh, from the government and a, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that just published uh, in, in December its final report. Uh, and in the process then, uh, we have had a reconfiguration of the research landscape and of the ways in which health issues are being approached. And this has been framed in terms of cultural safety, in terms of acknowledging this history and creating environments where there can be true dialogue between different points of view and ultimately modes of working that are shaped not only by the exigencies of science but also by the collective values of, it, of indigenous peoples, uh, creating a very complex uh, landscape where issues of ownership, intellectual property rights, for example, uh, and control over data by indigenous people have become paramount. Uh, and this has shaped all the research. So the project that I, I won't have time to describe today, but you can find out about on this website, is a project that's going on in many uh, First Nations communities across Canada right now for them to develop their own programs of mental health promotion for indigenous youth centered on culture, in which they take a general template for a program and then can adapt it locally uh, so that they are reconstituting their own sense of collective identity. So it's an interesting way to take some evidence-based practices that we think are generally helpful to people, uh, but to open them up to very um, a thorough kind of reconsideration of uh, cultural uh, dimensions of identity and experience. Uh, this is a training uh, group of uh, facilitators that went on a few months ago and a picture of the, a graduating family from this program a few years ago in, in central British Columbia. And what this project raises really is a whole set of questions about the role that serious attention to culture and context can play in reconfiguring mental health in ways that are not in conflict with local values, but really uh, working in some kind of collaborative, uh, creative way, and that is mutually enriching, because I think we all feel, uh, those of us who are participating in this, that we have gained a tremendous amount in our own understanding of the nature of mental health, of wellness, and uh, of sources of uh, of uh, um, recovery and well-being. Uh, so this points toward ways of approaching uh, global mental health in the future that would be more dialogical, more about uh, exchange and co-construction of knowledge, uh, and encourages us to think about what are the prerequisites for that to happen in terms of redistribution of power, in terms of resources, in terms of conceptual models that allow a legitimate place for uh, very different perspectives coming from uh, different uh, cultural points of view. Uh, and this requires both an internal critique in psychiatry, which this paper tries to, to do something of, and elaborating a kind of eco-social model, which this book tries to do something of, uh, and uh, which we will be continuing at our Advanced Study Institute, which I hope some of you can attend, and I brought some copies here. Uh, uh, to give you more information about that in our summer school. And uh, I thank you very much for your uh, attention.